Um, yeah. I was just listening to your your stuff. This is the video I mean, you uploaded a few days ago about forgiveness, and you read through Ezekiel and some of that stuff. It was really good, man. Thanks, man. It's an interesting conversation. Yeah, with Christian and I think it was Craig and Mitch or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got any thoughts on that? Or? Um. you guys were talking about the blaspheming of the Holy spirit and I like you're talking about it in terms of like unforgiveness, which I think is fine. Or someone was talking about it in terms of unforgiveness. It was probably me. <laughs> but, yeah, it was someone, but, but I think that's, I think that works, but it's also like if, if the Holy spirit is that, which like kind of guides you beyond yourself to the transcendent in, in some sort of, truth that that's outside of yourself um you know if you if you don't trust that if you blaspheme against the holy spirit let's say mean meaning if you don't trust that then uh you're kind of lost and like in in that sense like it's in connecting back to your your conversation like that's that's what provides forgiveness it's, it's what um, enables you to move on, be transformed, all that stuff. And if you blaspheme against that, like what, what hope is there for you? Like, that's the thing that's like, it's like the, the voice calling out to you to, that, to rescue you. And then you shun that. And then you're kind of that. Yeah. But you guys were ta- kind of talking about that along those lines anyway, but yeah, no, I think I'm tracking with you. That's that's kind of how I feel when uh, the when Moses, um, what is it in Exodus? I refer to this part sometimes too, but like uh, where uh, God says, "Move away from these people. I'm going to destroy them." And then Moses, I'm just going to look at it real quick. I got my Bible here because he I'm says something. My Bible too. <laughs> All right. Let's see where it's at. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it says um. Uh, what does he say? Now it came to pass the next day. You have committed a great, great sin. So now I, this is what Moses said to the people. You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And <clears throat> Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. I mean, that's kind of how I feel. It's like, if it's not uh, forgiveness, like you said, there's no hope. I'm just like, like, it's not even to make that statement to me. Like, if you, like, blot me out of your book, it's not really even a statement of, like, defiance or anything. It's just more like, if you're not a God who forgives, like, well, I have no part in your story. Like, there's no, yeah, there's no hope for me here. So, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about Job. Yeah, let's do it. Um, did you <laughs> did you watch the latest video that me and Terry, the last? I one? wanted to. I wanted to. Right. I haven't gotten to it yet. Well, I'm going to talk about something that we talked about there, so, but I just okay. wanted to know if if you heard about it or you listened to it or not, because you've been following quite a few of the videos. You've been leaving lots of comments. Uh, yeah, I've been watching all of them, so that's why. Yeah, that's probably where you noticed. If I if I had watched this latest one, there probably would have been like ten comments on it. I'm sure. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. So <clears throat> this goes along with all your ideas about. Uh, God's mercy seat and all that, which is really uh, interesting to me and and seems like it runs into what I'm finding in Job. So there's something interesting that happens. Um, So in Job 40, let's see. Um, So so God appears to Job in the whirlwind. God talks about... um, sort of the wonders of nature, then the animals. And then uh, Job answers. <clears throat> and Job's answer, he just says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. Um, and this is alluding to something that Job said earlier, which is, when he would he would he's remembering the days of old 
when he would come to the city gate and all the men are gathered and and when he would speak words to them it was like words of wisdom and he he said men would would put their hands over their mouths not because they were afraid of job or because they uh or not because they thought they themselves were terrible. It's just that they wanted Job to speak. And Job said, my words for them were like the latter, the latter rains. It was like this refreshing rain that comes. Um, and so he's remembering <clears throat> his old, the old days when that was the case. And, and then he laments kind of how he's become a byword among his people. And so th- this is why Job covers his mouth. Um, as God speaks, it's not because he's afraid of God or he feels belittled. He he's actually like it's it's in a sense he's in the he's in the presence of wisdom and wonder, and Job doesn't want to speak. So then God says this next after he kind of God says, "Dress for action like a man. I will question you. You make it known to me." <clears throat> and then in verse ten through 14 i'll just read this says adorn yourself with majesty and dignity clothe yourself with glory oh wait i gotta read the first the verses ahead of this to make sense of it so i'll start in verse eight will you even put me in the wrong will you condemn me that you may be in the right have you an arm like god and can you thunder with a voice like his adorn yourself with majesty and dignity clothe yourself with glory and splendor Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together, bind their faces in the world below. And I also, I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. So anyway... Like I was a little confused through through with that little section because it sounds like the uh, the vengeful Old Testament God that's kind of caricatured by like you know he's just angry and vengeful and <laughs> gonna smite everyone. Yeah. And, and uh, well, so God speaks. He talks about behemoth and then Leviathan. And then we come to the end of the book, which which is the epilogue. And Job makes this beautiful confession. And then after that, God rebukes the friends. Um, And so I'll I'll read for chapter 42, verse 7. It says, uh, after the Lord has spoken these words to Job, The Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, that's his first friend. My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, and I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken to me what is right, like my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Um. So this is this is interesting because, um, I feel like this is this whole scene of of Job being set up as the mediator between him and his friends um, is a fulfillment of what I just read in 40, which is how God treads down the wicked where they stand and how he binds their faces in the, in the earth. It's by reconciling and um, offering forgiveness to them. But they're so, <clears throat> you know, Sherry likes to say that the friends like have this sort of mechanical worldview. Like they're like, yeah. I'll do this and God will respond like this, you know, and it, it's just sort of like a, a very, um, yeah, it feels like karma to me. Like a, I think, yeah. Yeah. Like they, they kind of see it as like karma, karma, a karmic system or something. Yeah. And, and so God almost kind of like 
gives them something to do, but they have to bring it to Job, who is the one who's not following that system. He's the one who wants to see God and, um, and so, uh, but I was thinking about that in terms of, of your idea of, of truth on the mercy seat. And it, it seems like what I read in chapter 40 with God saying, I'm going to tread down the wicked where they stand. And then the, the forgiveness that is offered, you know, the sacrifice that the friends need to bring and the forgiveness and prayer offered to them by Job. Um, I think that's a fulfillment of what God was talking about. That's how he does it. That's how he conquers the wicked and how he brings them down is by reconciling with them. And, and, um, yeah, mercy, yeah. Mercy triumphs over judgment type thing. Yeah. yeah. That was something brand new for me that I just like learned as I was going through this last part of Job. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like you're right. When you have to actually wrestle with forgiveness, it's like an extremely humbling thing, because uh, you have to actually contend with yourself in a way too, and recognize you need it, and recognize you need mercy, and then uh, and recognize you need um, love that goes beyond yeah karma, goes beyond this mechanical world system. That um, there's a love that goes beyond it and runs deeper than it, I guess. So it's like a like the two sons, the prodigal son and the older son, like the older son. Um, I mean, I guess you could say maybe like you could, I guess you, you can't really say definitively, but you could ask the question, which one ultimately knows his father's love more. Is it the one who went off and wastes his wealth and, and realized his father's love isn't, isn't upon him doing works mm -hmm. or following his footsteps or something. Yeah. But then having to wrestle with going back to your father and actually receiving his forgiveness is so humbling. It's just, it's crushing. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. And then if your father comes to you, comes to find you and you choose the opposite and just harden yourself, it's like that, that I think is kind of like the judgment. It's just going to, you're ultimately, it's going to crush you and uh, rip you apart. Or you could look at it as you're just doing that to yourself ultimately. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's like the closer God draws near, it's like, are you doing it to yourself or is he doing it to you? Because it's like, it's just, you know, when love just like, especially yeah. forgiveness, like if someone's trying to offer you forgiveness and you don't want it, it's just like, uh, there's this level of pride. That's just, I don't know. That's, uh, extremely destructive, but you don't want it when you think you're right. You're just like, that's why it's so offensive. You're like, I don't need this. this, is this. Right. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of like an Exodus where it says like at some times that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then some other times it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Like you, yeah. it's, it's hard to figure out the, the causality of all that. Cause yeah, like, yeah. like Sherry was talking about just the present, like just by God coming, mm -hmm. there's a judgment that takes place. It's, it's, you know, yeah. in, in God's speech, he says, uh, uh, let me find it. Cause it's, he says, uh, this is a chapter 38, verse uh, 12. He says, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It's changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. And... Uh, there in verse 13 where it says that the dawn might take a hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked are shaken out of it um it i i never thought of the idea of you know you know we'll, we'll ask god we'll like where's your justice god when, when are you going to bring an end to the wicked kind of thing like when when is evil going to be no more he's like i do it every day by by when when the dawn rises, when the sun rises, that light sends all the wicked scattering. Yeah. The light itself is the judgment, and yeah, yeah. and it's it's you know just bringing things to light. Um, and uh, yeah, because then you see yourself, and others see you, and then you just 
you gotta you either flee away in terror or let it change you, I guess. Right. Yeah. But I think yeah. this is just such a beautiful image. Like it's just like every day this happens. The light shines. So Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, and it kind of makes you think, gosh, that reminds me of that verse. There's some weird verse in Isaiah where it talks about uh um in the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, as the light of seven days, or something like that. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? Yeah. No, because so I'm not I'm not oh, really okay. familiar with Isaiah. Uh let me see if I can find it. It's a yeah. It's kind of a cool part. Um gosh, I don't know exactly where it's at. Um, okay, yeah, here it is. Isaiah 30 verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Yeah. So it just kind of like you're talking about the sun comes every day and every day, but it's coming into like uh like this full state when the glories fully manifest. And it's like, I think Sherry's right when she says that, um, you know, when God's, uh, his coming is his judgment. And it's, um, I guess it's just your posture to it in a way. That's why like his love, to me, it just seems like his love is the fires of hell. It's the same thing. It's just uh, yeah. resisting to it. And like, I think, I think there was one part in the gospels where, um, Jesus is prophesying about uh, their destruction or something. And then he says, it might be in Luke. And he says, because you didn't recognize the hour of your visitation or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's like, just that, that phrasing always stood out to me. And maybe it's translated weird, but just the fact that it's like, it's just him visiting. Like he just comes and it's like the, the father comes and it should be, I don't know, like it should be a good thing, but it's just like, if you're, if you're resisting it and just, resentful i don't know it's just uh it could be it could be hell for you if you're just gonna kick at it and scream and yeah um, and resist his the light like you're talking about the light the love the life uh yeah and if you look at it and if i, I don't know for some reason it works in my head better if i look at it in terms of forgiveness i guess because it's just kind of like that to me if god if god showed up and said i forgive you and I thought I didn't do anything wrong. I'd be like, who are you? Especially if it was a person or like got through another person. Like if someone comes Jason, up and they're I like, forgive I, you. Yeah. And it's just like, well, who are you? Like, what did I do? Come on, screw up. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like, but the, uh, gosh, like the only, the only, re like, it seems to me like the only proper response for that, the, um, like when John the Baptist is like saying repent when the kingdom is at hand, it's like the only proper response is to repent. Cause it's like, if I'm like, no, I don't need repentance. So it's like, well, then obviously I do. Like, I mean, I can probably find somewhere in my life where I could be humbled a little bit. So, well, the, but the the but the message like kind of just kind of just rubs you the wrong way all the time. Uh, I don't well, like. I don't know. That's an interesting thing about the Book of Job is because that's what his friends tell him to do. Mm -hmm. Like, like I think very early, like the first response to Job was, uh, Job you need to repent and God is good and kind and he'll restore you. He's because Job is asking in chapter three, he's asking, why is God keeping me alive? He's, he kind of has this lament and he wants to be uncreated. Yeah. And then, and this sort of, and then he's like, why does God give me breath? What's the point of this? I'm just suffering. Um, and so his friend says, um, well, there's a reason why God's kept you alive. It's because he wants, he's given you a chance and here's your chance, repent and God will restore you and he'll give you more than you had before. And he's loving and kind and gracious. But if you harden your heart, um, then, then you deserve what's, what was happened to you. And Job's yeah. like furious about this. He's like, <laughs> he, he's like, no, I'm not going to. And what you're saying are, is lies. You're lying for God. By, call, by telling me I need to repent. And, and Job's, well, Job's vindicated about that. Mm -hmm. So that there, Sherry talks about the idea of integrity. Um, and, and that's what Job is defending. He's defending his own integrity. Um, and it has something to do, you know, it's not like pride in yourself. It's, it's some, it's, and it's not like, 
it's not self-esteem. It, it's some sort of confidence in the goodness of God's creation. And you're, and Job is confident in the creation that he is. And so he has this sense of integrity. It's hard to describe a little bit, but his friends interpret this as pride. And then they interpret that further as wickedness because he's defending this integrity and and it's hidden. You can't you can't see it. And especially after everything he's suffered, the friends have every every reason to doubt his integrity. Because the doctrine of retribution says the wicked suffer and the righteous are rewarded. So if you're suffering like this, Job, especially like in in a way that was clearly, you know, you lost everything in a single day. Uh, it's obviously divine. It's it's obviously uh, sent by God. It's not a it's not a coincidence. So obviously there's something going on, and and so they're they're you know this gets to their mechanical worldview is like, well, if you repent, God will re- restore. If you don't yeah. repent, God will punish. And and Job re- rejects this. Um, and he doesn't even have a clear answer. Yeah. All he, because it's not like he has a reason. He he doesn't have a reason that's been thought out. All he has is a sense of his, of his own integrity. That's all he's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is what God sees in the beginning when, when, you know, Job's said, it's said that he's blameless and upright. And then after Satan strikes him the first time, God says, look, look at my servant, Job. He still, he still maintains his integrity. Um, and, yeah. and then Satan doubles down and says, well, if you strike his body with illness, then he'll curse you, which, which he doesn't. And it seems like that hidden integrity is what God was valuing the whole time. And, and that, um, that integ- it's something like that integrity in Job needed to be known, needed to be made known. But how how do you get the world to know about? How do you get the world to know about that? Um, and so, basically, I I think. Um, that that there there was a comment or a a commentary I read from a sixth century Christian that said Job was beaten with a rod and so that his so that his fragrance could be spread more widely so that everyone could know yeah um and th- there's obviously allusions to to Christ in there that he yeah. he's raised up on the cross so that everyone will know that every knee will bow, every tongue confess. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I love that quote. I think I heard you mention that before. Yeah. But anyway, I bring that up just, just to be like, there, there's a, you know, like you said, you're like, there's obviously something I could repent of if, <laughs> if someone said repent. And I mean, in, I mean, I know yeah. what you mean. Like yeah, yeah. In, in in a in one case that's true, but in another case it's like it's like no. Yeah, <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> because you can't really turn it can't you can't you can easily turn repentance into a mechanical system. Like like and mm-hmm. then you're and then you're looking for what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? Mm-hmm. And it's just uh and it's really just a a turning closer to God. Uh there's this I used to pray it. I need to pray it some more. I used to pray it like when I first started coming back to God, but I would say, please always keep me in a continual state of repentance. And I think what I meant by that is just always a, a posture of just seeking um, to turn, turn, turn more and more towards him. Um, yeah. Cause if it becomes a, a way of like penitence or whatever that term is, where you're like looking for, what can I do? What can I do? What can I, uh, yeah. what can I do better? What can I stop doing? Then it's just, then you're right back in the karma system and then you're back in uh yeah what job's friends kept talking about i don't know and i really 
I really sympathize with his friends a lot because I'm yeah, just like, uh, yeah, I think there's something. I don't know if there's something there in the fact that I don't know if all of them, uh, Job as well, could have been previously seeing the world that way before this happened. I don't know. Because sometimes I wonder that just because they, they call him the teacher, sort of like he taught people. And it's like, did his friends actually learn this from him? And then they're just spitting his own. Oh, right. Like, yeah. But I, I mean, there's that's just total speculation. But then even still, it's just, I think I sympathize with them mostly just because it's just so easy to fall into that, um, that category of like, what what can I do? What can I, how can I earn God's love? Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's so easy, but there, but then, yeah, you read through it. You're just like, man, you guys are just being cruel to him. And like, <laughs> sort of, man, it's, and his, yeah, his integrity is like, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. Cause it's not, uh, I like what you're getting at. Cause it's like, it, it's deeper and goes beyond what I normally uh, perceive integrity as. Cause mm -hmm. like when you normally hear the word, you would think something like uh like you almost equate it to works or something, but it's more of like a, right. uh, it's deeper. It's like the, this holding like fast to God. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's kind of reminds me of like when Peter says to Jesus, like, where else should I go? Like you have the, like, I'm not this, this is all I have. It's just, mm -hmm. I don't know it's something under underlying all of that. It's just, uh, yeah. And the, the suffering part, it reminded me of, um, I mentioned this, uh, cause I've, cause I've been talking to Jacob, uh, lately, uh, you know, Jacob, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so he mentioned Isaiah 53, cause he'll say the suffering servant and he'll always say it's like plural or something The though the whole refer to the word deaths and he'll be like, see deaths is plural. And, um, and I think you could read that two ways. Like, I think you could think of it as like, well, I die daily. Like mm -hmm. I have all these deaths, but then if you, you could actually, I actually like what he does though. Cause he, he says, it's just about the suffering servant. And I'm like, I think that's probably like, that's more accurate. It's about Christ, but it's about more, more rightly the suffering servant. Cause you read through it and I'm like, man, it sounds a lot like Job. Like you're talking about, <laughs> like it pleased, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Like it pleased nope. him to beat him with a rod to disperse that fragrance or something because mm -hmm. the, so that the world might be blessed by it. And it's like, what a awful thing. And what an <laughs> honor at the same time. It's like, I don't know. He's this, I know, right? Like, I'm, like one of the most amazing like characters in the entire Bible now. And, and God mentions him later. Like he, I think in the book of Ezekiel, God brings him back up and he's like, even if like he, he references Job and that mm -hmm. I'm just like, man, that's, and then in the book of James, I think it talks about him again. And I'm just like, man, that's just, yeah. Eh. Yeah. Oh um, man. I'm going through first Samuel with some guys and uh, we're right at like first Samuel 20 or something. It, it's right when, when David kind of flees Saul for, you know, David's been like fighting for Saul, like being a commander. He's also been like in his court, like eating at meals and uh, playing music for him. Um, and so he's like involved in, in, in uh, Saul's kingdom, but, but like in, several chapters before like Saul is rejected by God and Sam and David's anointed as King. And so there's this, you know, and, and Samuel does all this and then kind of like leaves town is like, I've had enough of Saul. <laughs> and so Saul's kind of like trying to hold on to the kingdom and David's here. Uh, and, and David has that integrity that similar to Job um, because like, you know, when Samuel comes to anoint David, he, he, you know, sees all the older brothers and, and God's like, no, 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 it's not by outward appearances. And then he says, you know, and he's asked Jesse, do you have another son? He's like, well, yeah, David's out watching the flocks. And, and then God's like, yes, that's, that's the man. And, and there's an integrity that God recognizes in David. And then um, David's doing his best, you know, David gets anointed, which has got to be <laughs> mind boggling that, so Samuel comes and anoints you King, but then you're not really King. Saul's still King. There's still like this earth, like, so, so like, what do you do? And then Saul has, brings you into his service and like, you're serving the King 
and like you're doing good things for him and he he Saul is constantly getting angry at David because he's you know Saul Saul has slaved his, slayed his thousands David his ten thousands <laughs> the people are singing this song and and Saul's getting all butt hurt about it cuz <laughs> he wants it to be about him and then and then uh there's the all of chapter 20 is about um David's just like hyper paranoid because Saul has already tried to kill him multiple times. Jonathan's trying to play a, like a, a role, like trying to keep, you know, he's like, no, my dad's not trying to kill you. Uh, I would know about it. And David's like, no, I'm just like days away from death. You don't understand. And Jonathan's like, okay, what do we do? And they hatch the plan to, you know, David's not going to go to the feast. And if Saul gets angry, then he'll know. So David doesn't go to the feast and Saul gets angry and Jonathan knows. And um, this is the last, I think this is the last time Jonathan and David see each other. They're like, they're like kindred spirits. Cause, cause Jonathan, even though he's the prince, he's in line to be King next. He recognizes the same integrity in David. Um, and, you know, he says to him before he goes, he's, he's, he's like, remember me when, when you come into your kingdom when 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 you rule and there's there's just this man it's just heartbreaking because then david like goes off like they're they weep together then then david just leaves and then like for the rest of the book of samuel like david's just being hunted he's like (laughs) he acts crazy he's like run around with these these men who are questionable you know david's mighty men like all these sort of scoundrels and stuff they sort of gather around him and he you know he's he's nothing close to a king he's sort of this like robin hood ish character like out in the woods (laughs) like just sleeping in caves and and that's cool i never thought about that before just suffering um and but he's anointed to be king yeah. And he's a man after God's heart. And like he get he gets just totally banished and hunted and and he has chances to kill Saul and he doesn't do it. Yeah. Which which just speaks even greater volumes to his integrity. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Um but yeah, I see the same sort of that that same sort of thing in David that I was trying to talk about in terms of Job and uh, yeah. And, and what, what is that where, where, you know, David has to be exiled and suffer and go through all this stuff and, and in order that his, um, I don't know, his integrity can actually be displayed for everyone to see. Because isn't that the accusation Satan levels at Job at the beginning of, of the book of Job? Satan basically says that Job's not righteous because that's who he is. It's it's because you bless him and yeah. saying to God, 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 you bless him and you protect him. It's, he's not actually good. He's just doing yeah. this because he gets a payoff. Yeah, yeah. He blesses um, you because you bless him. You And if you curse him, he'll just curse you. Yeah. And so, you know, you think about any sort of, let's say there's just some wonderfully successful man. He's got a wonderful family, got a very successful business, um, seems to be very philanthropic and uh, upright and, and seems to be faithful to his family or whatever. And you can always level the accusation and be like, well, he's just doing it because everything's working. Like, yeah, you know, how you know just take all that away and then he'll he'll be you know backstabbing and murdering and committing adultery in no time um but yeah. it's it's when all that's given taken away is when you know because it's not just like a i don't know i i think it's i don't I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? I could have been talking for a while. Here. <laughs> no, no. I'm, yeah, this is great. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, 
I'd like to get a better grip on like what this word means. I was while you were talking to you, I like tried to look up what that word integrity meant in Job, and it just said integrity, and I'm like, well, that's that was helpful. <laughs> but I think it also said, I think it might have said when I looked down, scrolled down a little further, it said like innocence or something. So I was wondering if there's, yeah. if maybe there's a connection to some sort of um, like childlikeness to it as well or something. Because well, it's, yeah, it Sherry is, Sherry equates it to virginity also. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Mary's virginity yeah. is her, is her integrity. And oh, it's okay. the virginal aspect yeah. that enables you to, uh, receive Christ in you. Yeah. That's Christ really is born of a virgin. Yeah. 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 Cause if you look at it as in virginity in terms of like dedication or something that, that makes sense too. Like I, I'm dedicated to this one, to God and that's all I know. And that's all. Mm-hmm. So even if he curses me, I'm still, I'm still dedicated. I'm still, he's still my king. He's still my husband. Mm-hmm. He's still my, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, there's something to that. Definitely. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint. Cause it's like, uh, cause the word integrity is just a word and it's like, what's the, no. there's like a fundamental spirit behind it. That, that is uh, so uh, deep and binding that it's I- like hard to, hard to, like the the word in our English word integrity doesn't really seem to kind of put give justice to it, but it may, no. maybe it, maybe it's the best word we have for it, but I don't know. Yeah, and it has something to do also with like the self in sort of a Jungian sense. Um, okay. Or or yeah. in how Peterson talks about the self, and even when Peterson points to, uh, like when he talks about the golden ball, like Jung talks about the the golden ball too because it's in alchemical sim- symbolism and stuff and yeah. then it shows up in harry potter as the snitch is it the that when when they're playing the quidditch game or whatever i don't know if you know the yeah, in, never, in harry I, potter in 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 this i wasn't allowed to watch those devil movies <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't though but yeah but Peterson brings it up because this golden ball is in the is in the movie, and it's actually part of a game that they play when they're at school. They ride ride around on broomsticks, and they like throw. They have this bigger ball that they throw through hoops to get points. Yeah. So that's like the main game is they're like flying around the stadium, throwing this ball through these different hoops, and they're tra- they're getting, they're they get points that way. But there's actually a secondary game that's happening at the same time, which is. Uh, there's two there's a seeker on each team and they're after this little thing called the snitch and it's like it's it's this little golden ball with wings that like zips around like a like a hummingbird on on speed or something and so it's flying around and harry potter was a was a seeker at, at school in the game so he was like always flying after the snitch during the games and in one of the games he like catches it um but it ends up it, later on in the movie, it ends up being something like they he has to find this that snitch that was used in the game. And, and then it had I forget what it had inside of it. Anyway, he like. He has to use a, a special magic spell, but it opens up and there was like it's key to the ending of the of the story. I forget what it was, but huh. Um, anyway, that, that golden ball, it's, it shows up in fairy tales too, is the golden ball, the, Mm -hmm. like the princess and the frog, like she's playing with a golden ball and then it falls down in the water and she's like, Oh no, my golden ball. And the frog says the frog's a prince. And he's like, if you, he needs to get kissed in order to break the spell that's been cast on him. So he's like, if I get the golden ball for you, will you give me a kiss? And she says, yeah. So he brings the golden ball up. And then she kisses him and turns him back into a prince. At least I think that's how the story goes. It's interesting. But but Jung talked about all that as symbolism for the self, um, which I think has something to do with, uh, and you know, and he equated Christ as a figure of the self. Um, mm-hmm. and there's there's some kind of connection there with integrity too that kind of you know as trying to f- figure out how to define this thing um yeah i don't know it seems to show up in all the prophets though for sure like you mentioned in david and then all the other prophets it's like you read the book of hebrews when it talks about him being sawn and sawn in two and everything and it's like what is this this uh it's in like all the suffering servants and job is kind of 
you know, he's an individual, but he's also like a collective body for uh, suffering humanity or something. And it's, uh, but there's this, yeah, this, uh, that whatever this integrity is, this golden ball, this self, it's like, uh, yeah, it's so deep um, that I, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't even want to categorize it as like your soul or something. Like it seems different, but it's. Uh, yeah, it is something different. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you could just say it's love, but I don't know what you call it. But then it's, it's then why wouldn't you just say that? You know, it's something well, else. It's like that. I mean, that, it seems to be something that you can defend that you never have to repent of and that you can always defend. Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, it, it's some aspect of yourself that's that way. Yeah. That, that that's, that's that image of God. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of this, I like what Sherry said, You, or maybe it was you that said it, I can't remember, and it was like, uh, you almost have a claim on God, you can yeah. put it, yeah, because he created you, so it's kind of something like that, like, I'm your, I don't know, there's something, or maybe, I don't know if it's that, but it seems similar. Yeah, that's George MacDonald, he, he says, it, he in his, like, essay on Job, that's how he ends it, is, is by saying that... Um, making a claim on God is what God wants you to do. So, and, and he, he sort of frames it in terms of uh, like God created you and you yeah. exist. You didn't have a choice to exist. This mm -hmm. is the Hegelian throneness. Um, you're thrown into the world, thrown into existence in some, in some ways uh, you can, you can say, look, I didn't choose any of this. <laughs> this is in, in, Job in chapter three kind of gets to this too. He's he's like, it would be better if I was never born. Yeah. Then and it wasn't just about his suffering, although it was, but but he he's like, he wants to know the reasons for all this. Yeah. Um, and he's and yeah. um lost my train of thought, but no, I know what you mean. It's like, yeah, yeah, because God, it's like a child making a claim on his father and uh it reminded me of this uh there's this king arthur story i can't remember which one it was but it's got sir gawain in it that's how you say his name and he uh i can't remember exactly what happens it's like very vague but it, i need to i need to listen to it again but he um there's some guy he comes across and i can't remember if uh, what happens but somehow he ends up uh killing the guy's wife on accident or something oh. like that and then, um, because I think he's gonna, he decides to punish the guy, and so he goes to cut him down, and the wife steps in and he hits her instead. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, I think he feels bad about it, so then he's like, "Well, I'm gonna have mercy on you and not kill you." And the guy's like, "Well, now it would be a mercy to like, what are you doing? Like, just kill me." And it's kind of like the same thing. Like Job's, <laughs> Job's like thrown in this state of confusion, and he's yeah. just like, "If you're." if you are merciful, why was I ever born? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. like, just kill me now. Cause it's, uh, it's like this, this overwhelming grief of, of not, yeah. Of having all that hit you and confusion and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And it's, it's the like, same you, thing when, when Christ is in the garden and says, let this cup pass from me, mm -hmm. but not yeah. my will, but your will. And it's also when he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And it seems yeah. to be, um, I wonder what you think of this. It seems to be that that it's like like the the suffering we go through that that we don't understand makes us. Um, or maybe it'd be better to say that as like we're we are being created mm -hmm. still, <laughs> God's still creating us. Yeah, and. Sometimes that we'll experience that as uh, terrible. Um, like Im imagine if a, <laughs> if a piece of clay was sentient and then you started forming it and then, you know, you're pounding on it and then you, you're forming it and you're like, you're pressing on it and you make it into a vase and then you throw it into the kiln and you're firing it, you know, or you're, making anything like like these metaphors are all throughout scripture it's it's the threshing of the wheat it's the it's the you know being thrown into the fire and you know the 
uh, you know, is, is you like a, if you're a blacksmith, you're p- throwing the piece of metal in the fire and bringing it out and hammering it and throwing it back in the fire and taking it out and hammering it. Like, like if, <laughs> if that's you getting thrown in the fire and hammered on, like that, that experience is insane. Like yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. make sense. <laughs> you can't make sense of it. If you, you can only make sense of it in, in retrospect. And, and that's, that's usually what happens with people when, when they've resolved a trauma that's happened, um, they'll be able to say something like, yeah, it was terrible. Uh, I don't want to go through it again, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't um, remove it from my life because it helped make me who I am. Yeah. You know, and, and usually it's in terms of like, it's made me more empathetic for people. It's helped me help other people through similar circumstances. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, and you, and you see, I think that's what God's doing anyway. He, he's like building a, he's building a connection from heaven to earth and we're the, we're the links. And yeah. I think you're right. We're, we're that mediator. I mean, man is always said to be a mediator. And so yeah. like the book of Job is like the making of the mediator from the mediator's perspective. And it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> and wonderful think, all at the same time. Yeah. I think that's I think that's spot on. When you guys because yeah, I remember it was early on in your in your things and uh your videos. And my friend Mitch will bring it up all the time. Oh, I dropped Mitch's name. So I told him I'd try to do it. And it was just kind of a joke because he's made it. but it, oh, we gotta anyways, mention I, Cal I, too at some point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Cal couldn't be here because he didn't want to chug one of these. He's a zombie. His zombie state. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, but you mentioned so what you guys said was uh, Job is linchpin, um, in the Bible, and I think you're spot on when you say that. And Mitch often I think equates it being linchpin as in terms of a there's like this this thread of humility. I don't know what it is. The, this book, like the book, seems to be the most humbling book of the Bible when I read it. Uh, it just kind of not in a bad way, not in like, I'm going to, God's going to push you down and humble you. It just kind of, when you read it, it kind of has this repose at the end of just like, it's this humility in like a type of rest or something where you're like, yeah, where Job says, I've heard of you by the seeing, now, now my, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Therefore I pour myself and I repent in dust and ashes. But it's just kind of this, like, even when I read that, it just kind of seems like this, like, like this exhale of like, all right, like I'm, I'm here now. And like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know like a resolve or something. But I think the linchpin for me is the the mediator thing that, that you just mentioned. I think that to me, that's the linchpin of the, the why Job is, is the linchpin of the Bible is because he's the one that cries out for a mediator. And he's, he's the one that himself has made a mediator between God and man, like you said, for his friends and for the empathy of uh, all the other people. Like, cause he, uh, he, he is despised and rejected by men job is he says mm-hmm. that like I'm, I'm cast out like my friends my wife like they don't want right. to have anything to do with me and so now he's uh like he's the same as all those other people that are through i mean even if they are living wickedly it's like you know he's he's uh he's got one hand on both of them now one hand yeah. on god and one hand on the the people the the poor people suffering in the in the outskirts of uh, society and everything yeah, so, yeah, well, that's like Job in chapter, I think it's 26 and 27. It's right before the poem, Wisdom on Poem, the poem on Wisdom. Um, he, in 26, he identifies with the oppressed. He, and he's, he's like, he's like, not only am I one of them, but they make fun of me. <laughs> I'm like, a, he's like, yeah. I'm the song that they sing when they're making fun of people. Yeah. Um, and so he's like the oppressed of the oppressed. And then he talks chapter 27 is, is mind blowing and people don't know what to do with it because people think it's like a, like it shouldn't be attributed to Job because it sounds so backwards because he basically says, uh, let the wick, let my enemy be as the wicked. And then this is what the wicked suffer. And then Job starts to list everything that he's suffered. And so he's basically saying that I have suffered the fate of the wicked. Um, and, and like, I was puzzling over that. I was like, why, 
why would like first of all like it's an it's an amazing chapter that he even like can go there that he's like he's like because he doesn't get rid of the idea of the wicked and the righteous all he does is say he says to his friends he's like stop opposing me you're acting wickedly and this is what happens to the wicked <laughs> and then he lists <laughs> off your children will die your you know everything <laughs> like he's he just lifts off all the thing that's already happened to him and so yeah. you're just sort of like job you're making the <laughs> argument that this stuff happens to the wicked and you're trying to defend but what he's what he's doing or what's happened to him is he's not doing anything this has happened to him he's like i've suffered the fate of the wicked i i can identify with the wicked and then previously in the chapter he's identified with the oppressed that the wicked are oppressing and so he he's like he's lived he can um he can identify with this vast swath of humanity yeah. um yeah. from from the righteous oppressed to the to the wicked suffering for their wickedness and yeah. that's what makes him a mediator and and this i said this in the in the last podcast um but i think that's why god wants him to be the mediator is because what a you know if you have someone that's mediating between you and god let's say you want them to empathize with you right yeah, yeah and so yeah. who's who's the best the the person that could empathize with you the most would be the best mediator for you and yeah. and that's what god is making like that's what god is yeah. creating he's creating the best mediator yeah mm -hmm. you know for for you and yeah. And so, you know, we think, you know, we, th we think of, um, like God's trying to reconcile himself to the world through Job. He wants to reconcile himself to the oppressed. He wants to reconcile himself with the wicked. Yeah. And he needs, and he needs someone to stand in the middle and, yeah that that's you yeah, know that's that's why job gets gets chosen you know yeah both fortunately and unfortunately <laughs> yeah you just like uh yeah yeah and yeah and i think you're spot on with that especially um especially if you take job like like you i'm mean, like you've mentioned before as uh like you could even look at him as a collective body of like the suffering servant and everything suffering yeah man because it, i think it is that kind of like that servant's not the right word either i don't think but kind of that that because i was about to relate that to the integrity but i guess in that sense of like the the servant that's going to cling to god like i'm i'm going to still serve you i'm going to follow your ways um but that they still suffer through it all and it's like we're all he has made them all like sheep to the slaughter and it's a uh, gosh i'm trying to think of how to tie all this in like the mediator is given like the judgment almost because god knows he's gonna be merciful he's gonna be forgiving he's gonna yeah that's right he's gonna he's gonna be empathetic and so uh it's i think it gets at that truth on the mercy seat thing it's like the integrity uh is sitting on his throne of mercy right that's a, right yeah and so it's like, I think it's the same thing when Jordan Peters has something like truth nestled within love. It's like, you're yep. still holding to this truth and you're still not yourself kind of like, just say, well, screw it all. I'm just going to be wicked and let mm -hmm. us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Like right. you're, you're not going that way. You're still holding on to your integrity, the truth, but it's in, in this, it's on a throne of mercy at this point to where it extends all the way. He sees himself with the wicked now. So it's like, now the gates of hell are open. It's like, if that's right. where the wicked are, it's like, yep. well, now he's just opened them and he's pulling them out. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. And to me, that's, I think that's, yeah, that's like the whole story of the Bible. But that part, you mentioned that is like, that's one of the parts that makes me cry too. And the, <laughs> um, the, you know, well, it's Ezekiel and this, it's this yeah. verse in Ezekiel and it kind of gets the same thing where God, it's just, like, it makes me cry almost every time I read it because God just says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I should not destroy it. 
but I found no one. And it's just that that part where like he's actually looking for someone yeah. like Job and he doesn't yeah. find someone and you're just like, Man, yeah, that, that gets me every every time. Yeah, that's that's heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he's searching for him. Yeah, and even the book of Lamentations, when you were talking about Job, it kind of reminded me of that too. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of him as well, because in the book of Lamentations it says, like, you've you've brought us to the lowest pit. You brought us down here. And it's like now the the I mean there's like it's such, like you said, it's such an awful freaking thing when you're going through it. But it's like there's such a blessing in that because then you're in the yeah. pit with the prisoners and then you can identify with them and then uh bring them god's love in those places mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's right and uh yeah i mean and we see this happen you know to the jewish people throughout the old testament it's just like they get they get exiled to babylon and they ask like why is this happening you know and part of the reason is there was corruption in their society and the you know that they they had turned the the temple into um something that it wasn't supposed to be either was you know a mechanical um religious thing it wasn't actually um no one was actually seeking god with their heart but but then the other part of it was is like was like god is making you into a people yeah not just any people but the people that will that will bring the Messiah that will, that will mediate between me and the rest of the nations. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, that, that, that's clearly said to Abraham is just like, like, I'm going to bless you and through you, I'm going to bless all the other nations. And so the, the Jewish people have this mediator role that they're, that they're playing. And, and part of the, their success of doing that, um, lies in the fact that they were <laughs> you know overrun by the babylonians and thrown into exile and then you know brought back and then they had to like rebuild the walls and all that stuff they've been through it all they know so yeah. that makes them the perfect mediator between god and the other nations as well in this in the same way that you know job is a mediator for the for for his people so yeah yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like yeah, yeah, like the story of Israel. They've they've reached they've reached both heaven and earth. Like there's Solomon's kingdom. It's like they were at the pinnacle. They're up in the heavens, and then in Babylon, they're down in the lowest pit. And they uh, right. Yeah, like all the way from heaven to hell and and back. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and I kind of I often wonder if that's like, uh, if that's going to happen or or has happened or is continuing to happen with Christianity as well. So I think that's what I was trying to get with the um, that weird, but in Romans 11, it's kind of like that. And the Ezekiel 16 thing, it's just kind of mm -hmm. like you, uh, when you see God saves the uttermost, then you're able to like, and that's just, uh, he's going to have mercy on all. Like if he can have mercy on me, then I can have mercy on you. And then he's having mercy on all. Cause it is, mm -hmm. it is through, uh, yeah, it's like through, through each man is how god's working like he he's he works you know they say when when did we see you jesus when did we see you like when did we not give you water when did we not give you and then the other people mm -hmm. that the sheep and the goats parable or something and then they're like when when did we see you when did we actually feed you and he's like when you did it to the least of these mm -hmm. my brother and you did it to me and the and the problem the the thing is like we're all brethren like there's that part with the what is that that parable jesus gives about oh this good samaritan and it says, this guy wanting to justify himself came and asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gives that parable. And it's like, it's just all relative. Because if you trace it back, there is one son of God at the beginning. It's Adam. And then everybody in the middle is connected. And then there's one son of God at the end. And like you said, we're all being, we're continually being made right now. It's like, mm -hmm. we're, it's the son of God. And then everybody in between is connected. And there's son of God at the end. And it's like, they're, okay, well, we're all brothers in, in some way and it's just right yeah yeah so it's all it's all uh yeah you got to 
it's that yeah it's that struggling with your brother i guess and having to come back to reconciliation and be and be uh, uh it it's this weird it's this weird tension though i i'm not try, quite sure what to make of it because it's like it's like it almost makes love more and more the more you have to contend with with one another like my mom was i was talking to my mom i think it was last night and she was talking about my nieces and nephews so they're her grandchildren and yeah. so i guess uh the older one caitlin was upset um and she said the younger one ava was just sitting there with like a smirk on her face so my mom was like i knew that ava did something and then come to find out i guess ava had kicked her and then my mom was like ava you need to go apologize to your sister and she's like no i don't want to do that and it's like you don't like you don't like that's the <laughs> that's like the struggling with the angel or something with jacob yeah. and Esau. it's like you don't want to wrestle that you don't want to go apologize and have to actually deal with reconciliation i remember when i was little my mom would do that with us like sometimes we'd get in a fight and she'd make us hug until we and i'm just like yeah. it's the worst thing ever you hate this person <laughs> right now and you're like i have to hug them like i really and sometimes i think about that too even with heaven i'm like god if i actually get mad at this person or actually despise this person <laughs> my luck i'm gonna go to heaven and god's gonna make him my freaking neighbor and i'm gonna have to deal with him every day until i so get right, right in my eternal heart eternal hug <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> until you're actually <laughs> reconciled. And it's like, yeah, because everybody's everybody's a brother in some way. Everybody's connected to some degree. And uh, yeah, I don't know the other part. And this is uh, something I'm still trying to work on. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you have some thoughts on it. Is uh, even with, I mean, because I basically, I kind of, I basically believe in the re- repentance after death type thing or reconciliation through that um i think because of those passages about the the, the dead rising up in the judgment so it's like right there and then the judgment happens and so um it doesn't seem to be arbitrary there seems to be like there's there's a judgment so there's probably a uh there's a and in my head i think there would be a, a repentance as well or something you mm-hmm. know before you get um so anyways, that's, I guess, kind of neither here nor there. But I think about um, even the people that I could say are cut off. Um, like I could, I can think of like the most extreme examples or something and think of Hitler or something and say, no man's going to want to reconcile with that guy. But mm-hmm. then I'm like, well, what about his mom? Like that just always gets me. I'm just like, what about, what about his mom? Like, was it this, like, there's this thing where... I don't even know if it's the scripture, but I just remember this line and I don't even know what it's from. I thought it was in scripture. It might not be, but it says, I, I remember you in your youth. And I'm like, if there's just, uh, if I was that person's parent, I think to some degree you would always see them and be able to see them as a little child. As right. like when, And then I'm like, and then if I can remember them, then it's like, I can't forget them. And then if I can't forget them, you can't stop loving them. And then that love's either going to torment them eternally until they finally return to it. Yeah. It's like, I don't see how you get around that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think when you're trying to imagine someone as, as a child, like you're trying to like, that's getting to that integrity thing again. Like what's that, what's that thing that, you know, people will betray their integrity. That's, that's a problem. Like, I think, yeah, the, that might be one of the foundational you know when we betray our integrity like what do what do you what's there to rescue you like you have to be brought back and 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 restored it's it's sort of like a you know the whore babylon like she's she has no integrity left but so how do you restore her you know to a virginal state again to, to having integrity and so like um that's why i think like it it's you know it's mostly about you know it's mostly about healing rather than um punishment like and sometimes healing is painful and terrible and it's the fires of hell yeah um but you know i think that's that that the goal is not um justice in some sort of you know some sort of weighing of the scales that that justice is actually 
exactly what we see at the end of Job is the reconciliation. Yeah, that's real justice. Is when I think George McDonald says when enemies are turned into friends. That's that's when. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's I think that's I think a lot of our, you know, framing framing the gospel in terms of, um, you know, a punitive process, you know, or uh, in terms of like in terms of just a legal process is is not. You know, there's there's probably ways that it could be helpful, but I think fundamentally it it kind of misses the bigger picture of what actually is happening. Um, we get so caught up in like the payment and forgiveness of sins that that we kind of lose track of like what God what is God doing in the first place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it seems to be like, um, in order for in order for things to have real being. And or you know, they they have to be separated from God in a sense. So because like if they're 100 percent part of God, then they're just it's just part of God. It's not something else. Yeah. You know. And so the way I think about it is like there has to be a, a withdrawal of God. So imagine God's everywhere at once, like He's just infinite. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now in, in order for anything to have any kind of identity outside of that infiniteness there has to be a space that's made so there's like a withdrawal that's like and then and then something else could have their sort of own being but you know it's a partial being it's not totally separate because it's like they get their being because that's what god pours out to them gifts gives them and so like i I just imagine like a like a like a (laughs) a sphere of it's the void yeah and then, and then god like pours himself into the void and then um that's that's creation is, is yeah. all the things that will have multiplicity to them and they all have their identity like they all have their source in god but god in a sense both fills everything but yet also it is withdrawn so everything has its own being all at the same time there's this balance because if it's the balance between multiplicity and unity because too much unity and nothing has its own identity too much yeah. multiplicity and there's nothing keeping it together. So that's why love is so important is because it's, it's that which binds everything yeah. together without everything just either falling apart or, um, you know? Yeah. It's like the, yeah, the, or you could say the, the chaos and order, like you said, unity, multiplicity, you could kind of say, mm-hmm. okay, like, because if you have too much multiplicity, it's just kind of all chaos and nothing's held together and then too much unity and everything's just like too yeah, it'd much be like, order or something. Like a, I use the example of a bike. Like, um, so if you have a bike, yeah, if it's all working right, it's like the perfect balance of multiplicity and unity because the wheels are separate and like, the yeah. gears are a little bit separate so that they can turn and move and like the bike has a purpose. And like, if, if the bike has too much unity, like say you put it into like a, a car crusher and you smash it into a cube, like, yeah, yeah. you have greater unity, but now it's not a bike anymore. It's, it lost its purpose. And then yeah. also the same thing is if like you take the parts and you just throw them along the street, you have, you know, you have greater multiplicity, but you still lost the bike. And, yeah. And you know, in order for the bike to be a bike, there has to be like the, the, these balances that, that are made. Um, and. Oh, that's a, that's a really good way of describing it. So, so, but I, you know, I, I kind of had a personal experience with, with God kind of withdrawing from me, not because of sin, but just because he wanted, it, it was right when I was going uh, I was trying to make a decision about college or going into ministry and stuff. Um, and, and God kind of spoke, like God spoke to me and sort of made it known that he was going to withdraw for a while. Just, <laughs> and just so I could like, it it wasn't, you know, often we talk about God's presence being near us and then if we sin we push him away 
and then the way we get God back is we is we repent and and you know but but I had an experience where it had nothing to do with sin it was just God withdrew yeah and it was kind of a difficult time but it was like the 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 thing he kind of told me was that um because because I said to him I said you're uh you're leaving me aren't you and and he was like yeah but you'll get to know me better in the long run so uh and that's the case like it's true took years yeah. to, to finally wow. kind of like see that fulfilled i mean really it was it was like 15 years between when i could finally say like oh yeah that's true and even that you know even after that i'd be like you know you'd still pray for god's presence and seek him in prayer and stuff it wasn't like it was devoid of church or you know other disciplines or whatever but it was it was really a type of withdrawal and and i i think it's in that same sort of way it's like it's like god used it to make me wow and into like you know give me an identity and so yeah that's man there's this line in a it's a, like an old christian metal band or whatever but there's um uh, he says in an old christian good. what it's, it's a, like a christian metal like uh, i don't know if you ever listen to this but it's like there's a genre it's oh, like, Christ, like christian christian hardcore band I thought you whatever. said metal and i was like i was like what's what's christian what's a christian metal i was trying to think no, of like no, some physical object <laughs> i said i said band but yeah i guess band could be anything though yeah so i don't know yeah. I, but yeah but there's this line that says um what good is the whole world when i promise no tomorrows i only promise your tomorrows will never take you past my palm and it's always that last i love that last line i i promise your tomorrows will never take you past my palm and that kind of remind me of what you're cool. saying where god's like he withdraws from you um gosh like 15 years you said but it's like somehow you're always in the palm of his hand and you're still in yeah this. yeah uh yeah i don't know it's it it also reminded me of because you, I mean, I think you go through those times where it's like, you know, it's a, where you feel like you're scratching and clawing just to find them. And it's like just everything's yeah, dark. Yeah, for sure. Everything's dark. And, um, and you just, I remember praying that one time, it was a few years ago, and I was just like, uh, I had my, like, just like, my wick is low. Just like keep it burning. Like, I, like, it's just like, it's about to go out. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, but, uh, that verse in Acts came to mind. It says, "So that they might, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us." And it just kind of reminds me of that. Like you just feel like you're groping. Yeah, that's right. Like nothing blindly, and then it's, then He says, "And He's not far from any." So you're like, it sure feels like it though. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Sometimes we're just we don't see it, and so God just waits until we do. And he's patient. Like he'll just wait, you know, just like what you're talking about at the beginning with the prodigal son. He'll just wait for the prodigal to come back. He's not in any hurry. And when the yeah. prodigal comes back, he'll run and greet him and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think you're right too with the finding your identity, because it like it takes a it takes a fall or something. Well, in your case, it doesn't even sound like a fall. I mean, that's really yeah, my that's case. That's like heart uh, wrenching. I'm, this is why I think <laughs> sin isn't a problem for God, because sin yeah. actually acts in that same way. It can be a fall away from God, and I d yeah. ideally it's yeah, not yeah. it's not good. Yeah, but, yeah. But God uses it, so so it's like, I, God doesn't want me to sin and fall away from Him, but if I did, God will use it. Yeah, I'll yeah. be like, all right, this is the way we're going. This yeah. is what we're doing now. And I'll shape uh, you from it. And yeah. Yeah, it's the yeah, goats. Yeah. The goats yeah. go that way. They're just like, yeah, it's the kid that's like, I'm not saying sorry. Like, all right, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what yeah. we're doing now. But in the long run, like you said, I mean, it's it, it forms your identity. It forms who you are. Yeah. And, and God withdrawing from you is like, a, um, 
I liked how you mentioned that he like creates a space though, um, because I think it might have been Nate Heil that and Jed at uh, one time at, when I was talking to them, they said, uh, "Forgiveness makes space." And it's like yeah, he like he withdraws, um, and it's like he takes away. It's not that the truth is taken away or something, but it's like it's still there. But he just like encap encapsulates you in the state, the space of forgiveness, so you can have all this room to find your identity or something. Uh, I I don't really know. Well, that at, that space then, where identities are formed, that's a womb. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I and mean, this that, whole universe is like that. It's, yeah, that's the wisdom yeah. of God. Is is the, the that, that's Sophia. It's there before the found. There before the foundations of creation. It's I mean it's also Christ. This is yeah. the this is the primary aspect of Christ before he's incarnate. It, it's the wisdom. But um yeah, that that's so fascinating. We're just looking at things that way too, because it scales up. I think I think you you and Cherry had mentioned that before. Like it's just wombs like all the way up. Because like <laughs> then then you can even zoom out and you look at it's the universe all the way and it's like yeah, it's like, well, the universe is like just all this this big ocean, basically, this big space ocean. And you have this seed or this logos, this earth yeah. right in the middle of it. And it's like, yeah, what the, what the heck's going to happen? Like further <laughs> up and further in, I don't know. But that's yeah, right. it's yeah, it's insane. Yeah. But uh, that's how God yeah, makes things. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, yeah, the fall. Um, sorry, the, the identity thing. The one thing that came to mind, too, is remember, have you seen the Sandlot? Mm -hmm. yeah that's because you said i don't think god has a problem with sin and i don't think he does either um because there's this there's a scene in that and she's like it's before he's making all his friends and he's in his room playing with his tinker things you know and it fires and it like hits the mom in the forehead or something and yeah. he's like and he says something like um he says face it mom i'm always just going to be an egghead and she's like well you'll always be an egghead with an attitude like that and then she tells her son like this is the advice she gives him is like go out in the world get into trouble like make yeah. friends, like break the rules. Yeah. And I'm just like, I think there's, there, there is that in God where he's just like, like, like he wants to tell the other son, not the prodigal son. He's like, yep. go out, like yeah. experience life. Like find yourself. Yeah. Cause yeah. what is like the older brother, the, the older brother, like after the prodigal comes back, the older brother's all resentful to the father. It's like, why are you doing this? And yeah, you know, the father says, well, your brother was dead. Now he's alive. We've got to celebrate. And the, and the older brother was like, you never even let me and my friends have a party. You never let us have a goat so that I could have a party with me and my friends. And his dad's like, you never asked. <laughs> you, know, like, you didn't, you never asked. You, like, everything I have is yours. You could have had anything you wanted and you never yeah. even asked. He's like, face it, son, you're just an egghead. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah yeah. like you couldn't because he was so worried like you can i don't know i imagine that he's so worried he doesn't want to ask because that's what the younger son did because he asked yeah. for his inheritance which was wrong to do he yeah, shouldn't yeah. have done that so he but he he like makes the other choice where he's like i'm not going to ask for anything and that's yeah. the wrong choice too because you don't get to know your father that way yeah 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 exactly and i don't think and it's weird like i don't think you we'd sit here and justify like going out and spending your money on harlots is the right thing to do. But it's weird that the, that, uh, yeah, I just, I was thinking about this. I was talking about this yesterday. I was trying to get this idea because it seems to be just this pattern of the blessing skipping the firstborn. It's like the firstborn is so, uh, orderly or something that the right. blessing seems to skip him and it falls to the second, uh, the second one who goes out and makes all the problems because, the promise he finds that the promise is is not about the works or anything it's mm -hmm. like, like jacob was the deceiver and he he's the one that ended up uh yeah like wrestling with his brother to where he had to get forgiveness from him and then it's like right. well, that's that that's the promise it's this love that that goes deeper than all the all the tension between us all the you wanting to kill me me stealing yeah. your like blessing you know it's like yeah. there's there's this love this connection that runs deeper than that and that's like that's the the blessing that i think that the second born finds in the in the pig's pen and the belly of hell and all these places it's like mm -hmm. something something like that it's yeah it seems to be this this pattern and it's not that it's not 
the interesting thing is like, yeah, like the father says, it's not that it's not there for the, the older son. Like it's always there and he's always standing on it. It's just like, you didn't see it. Like, <laughs> so <yeah. he's> like, <laughs> so he what do you think all this something. is? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Matthew Peugeot was talking about that. Did you watch the video of him and Peterson? Yeah. Yeah. He was talking yeah. about the, the first, or was it? Cause I watched one with him with uh, Jordan Peterson and then I watched one with Tammy Peterson and I forget. Uh, what... Yeah. I watched both too. And I can't remember what it was either. But he was talking about the which, firstborn but... and how the firstborn doesn't have any time. He's got to make decisions right now because like he's, he's yeah. got to, he's got to, there's a, there was a sense of time where the, the older son just needed to make decisions to keep things ordered and, and, you know, a problem would come up. He would have to act now. He doesn't, he doesn't yeah. have time where the second born always had time to think and then could come up with something else later or not. It wasn't, yeah. he didn't have the responsibility of doing the things that the first born had. And so there's something, something to that where like, yeah, he doesn't like the identity's not weighing the his father's house and his father's identity isn't weighing as heavy on his shoulders or something. Like, yeah. It's something it's like not, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And it's, God, it's just crazy. That's what I mean. It's just insane how it works. That's why uh, it, it's insane how the redemption and the reconciliation works because it's just like the, the, the firstborn, you could say, falls in error. I don't even know that he doesn't even have to fall in error. He could live perfectly right, just like do everything right. And it's like, um, he just doesn't, he just might miss it or just not see it. Yeah. Then, that, well, that's what happens to the older son. The older yeah. son doesn't sin, and he still yeah. doesn't understand his father. Mm -hmm. like both, and, then the, and, and even the younger son doesn't understand his father because he comes back. He says, "Maybe I could." All he does is when he's in the pig pen, he know he remembers that his dad was kind to the servants, and he's like, "Maybe I could be a servant." Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that's that's his hope is is that my dad's kind to the servants. I could maybe be a servant, and and the dad like reestablishes him as a son again. Like both of them totally, they don't understand their father. Yeah. Both yeah. of them miss it. They, they, uh, but the younger son does definitely understands him better because the older yeah. son's resentful in the yeah, end. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. You know, that's that's it, the son is... that, that needs to be told, like, go out and get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a, but it's like even, even if he does, and I think it's through when the younger son, uh, hits the the pig's pen and then finds finds his father's love like still waiting for him. Um, then it's like I think that's what it means in in Romans when it says through the mercy shown you God will have mercy on all. It's like the younger right. the second born uh, receives the blessing, receives the mercy, receives the promise. That's like just this just the love of God, and then it's it comes through him, and then it goes back to the firstborn, and then mm -hmm. just like finds everything back together what is that part i'm trying to find it really quick uh Romans 11 it's like the story of joseph joseph does that yeah concerning the gospel they are enemies for your sake but concerning the election they are beloved for the sake of the fathers for the gifts and the calling of god are irrevocable for as you were disobedient to god you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience even so these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you they also may obtain mercy for god has committed them all to disobedience that he have might mercy that he might have mercy on all mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, yeah i like that you brought up joseph too yeah that's uh he he's the savior of his brethren um, yeah he suffers in order to end up being in that mediator place too yeah that's fascinating and he's also i've also wondered about that i haven't spent nearly it's like a fleeting thought that went through and i never spent any time with it but i wonder if there's some way where he's like a mediator with uh egypt as well um like he even he stretches down to egypt and the god the god mediates to egypt yeah well like joseph is kind of um because he's uh he has two children in egypt as well so now he's like got a connection there and so um no it's something is, like that is in the there seems to be this weird and this just might be the way my mind thinks, but Egypt seems to be a, 
I don't know. There seems to be a different symbolism going on with the, within each of these nations. Mm -hmm. And Egypt seems to be kind of like a. I think in my mind, it kind of I conceptualize it as as almost like uh, materialism, or just like because I think in Ezekiel he calls Egypt your very fleshy neighbors. So just kind mm -hmm. of the, uh, yeah, just the things not not I guess just the things that are because I mean if you look at ancient Egypt, obviously they worship gods. But if you're mm -hmm. like I think in the story of the Bible, it's kind of like they uh, what does it say? Um, the land uh, of Canaan receives water from heaven so it receives mm -hmm. blessing from god but the land of egypt it says they they it's like associated with toil like they water their land by foot like they go get it from the river and bring it mm -hmm. back and it's a it's kind of like this very more earthly i guess more material and so but then right. there's a that makes a sense. connection a connection between joseph and and uh and canaan in that way that the two lands how does it he's, got, he's got one foot in both almost Oh, Sorry, right. What, what are you asking? No, I was just at. No, you answered it. Oh. I, I, was, I was thinking about there's such a weird verse, like after all the plagues of Egypt. Okay, so um, let me see if I can find it. Oh, I can't. I don't even know if I remember it right. It was something like when, um, so the people. Right. Is it right after the plagues? Oh, I don't remember what it. If I I can't remember, I probably didn't <laughs> remember it wrong too, but it was something something about like, like, God went out with the Israelites out, and along with them came all the other, like came there were foreigners that came with oh. them too, but then like yeah. the other gods came like it, but it was like the heavenly host went with them as well. Oh, whoa, that's fascinating. I don't yeah. know, but I may be remembering it wrong. Um, so, no, I mean, I think you're probably right. I don't know if uh, I know it says a mixed multitude goes out with them, but I think there's there they reference it in other parts of the Bible too. So you could even be remembering it from another part because I think it there's other parts where it'll like you know give a recap or something. It'll be like they came out of Egypt and they brought right. Uh, yeah, there's a it might be the prophets because there's one. There's one of the prophets where he mentions, I remember he mentions like while they're in the wilderness, after they come out of Egypt, they were serving these other gods. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Gosh, I'm not going to remember it either. So, I mean, I think, I think you're right. Cause I think it does allude, allude to that in this, in one of the prophets. Cause didn't like right. Egypt sort of start declining in its, in its influence and stuff. Once this happened, like after, or how, I mean, was Egypt still like a world power for? Oh, I don't know. A thousand years. Yeah, probably. I don't, I don't know history. But I don't know. I know. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> now we're out of our depths. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can I just no speculate idea. from here on. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a. I mean, it's kind of like I don't know. There's. It's interesting because it seems like there's this. Uh, yeah, I mean, they kind of experience that if if Egypt is kind of like this materialism or very fleshy neighbors or very yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a kingdom of like as he says, their horses are horses of flesh and not spirit or something in Isaiah. So then, like when you come out of that, uh, you go through like the Red Sea. It's like this birth, and then you're just in the wilderness, and it's like the things of the earth are just like you don't engage in them as much, or even if you do, it's like there's no, they're they're not yeah. as. Like you now have a trend, like you, a transcendent perspective or something, and it's like you got to walk, go through this walk through the wilderness where you, before you can. Yeah, uh, well, that's kind of what initiation ceremonies are about. Well, and even it's about like, you know, we're even in like our Christian stuff. We're born physically, and then we have to be born again in the spirit. Yeah. Like yeah, 
like there's this idea of like um the material is like our mother it's what we're yeah. born out of but then we we almost have to uh cuz cuz initiations like a lot of initiation rituals will be the the purpose is, is to take the young men out from the care of their mothers and into uh the the service with the other men in the tribe and so there's there's usually an initiation to mark that cutoff and sometimes it's even like fairly traumatic like they take them out and bury them in a cave and then take them to the woods and and leave them for a week and then they come back and <laughs> then they welcome God. them back in the tribe and now they're men instead of and the yeah. and the, the trauma actually serves as like because the bond between mother and child are so is so strong that you have yeah. to like mark it and cut it off Otherwise yeah. you'll get that devouring mother thing or overprotective mother thing. And then they won't actually become a man. Um, yeah. And so, so you have to have that cut off and there seems to be that, that like the material world is our mother and wow. like we, we love our mother and our mother loves us in a sense. Yeah. But in order for us to actually become people, there has to be like a cutoff. And I think that's actually kind of what suffering and trauma does in our life too. Is it, is it kind of make, it puts a distance between us and the world, yeah. you know, and that can be, that can be bad in a way because it can be too traumatic and then you're too cut off from everything because like, not only is there, is the, that cut off, you know, you're, you're sent away from your mother but you're also welcomed back into the tribe in some way and so if you yeah. have an experience where you're cut off from like the earthly but you're not welcoming into a spiritual family like when you're born of the spirit well then you're some sort of orphan yeah. that's expected to survive on their own and you can't so like you just have this trauma and you have never been accepted into like a spiritual i don't know if that makes sense but no, I think but, it does. I think it kind of, yeah, I think it does. Cause like, if you have a mixed multitude go out with Israel, it's like, uh, cause if you actually went out with them, I'm just thinking that like, if you, I think it's the times where you kind of feel like on the outside of the church too, or something, if you ever felt like that, or like, mm -hmm, or you sure. feel like, a, or you feel like a heretic or something. And it's yeah. like, well, I'm like, you're still kind of out in the wilderness uh, somewhere. And it's like, you're not really in the, uh, you're, you're part of it, but you're not at the same time. Yeah. And it's, it is kind of traumatizing. I don't know. It's a, yeah. yeah. And sometimes I think that it's sometimes necessary um, in, for, in terms of mediating too, where you're, God's trying to put you a foot in both places, but then it feels awful for the time. But that yeah, is interesting. You, well, because you can't be hostile towards your mother. Like that's yeah, not yeah. right either. Like you have yeah. to be reconciled her, her to her in a new way. Yeah. Um. And it's the same with us in like the physical world. We can't necessarily be hostile, but we can't necessarily go back to like our childlike sort of dependence. Yeah. That kind yeah, of yeah. thing. And and so it's. Yeah. 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 That's, that's fascinating. Because like, I, I think materialism kind of, well, it's weird because like, I guess materialists, we try to rule over um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the material world rather than and then so but then people go the other direction married. where they're like they're like new agey and stuff which seems to be more like a regression back into some sort of uh, childlike yeah, state mm -hmm. with, yeah, with the material world rather than i don't know to be unified in love somehow i don't know yeah it's like a marriage like like a first first she's eve like mother earth is eve and then you grow up and then it's like then she has to uh, because, I don't know, I don't want to say marry, but it's like you got to grow up and you got to get married to her or something. And because uh, yeah. there's like, there's Eve and then there's Hagar, which is like Egypt. And it's like the, because it calls Egypt the house of bondage. So it's like, I think just being stuck and bound in the state of materialism mm -hmm. where your 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 dependency right. becomes, becomes solely on that or something. Like even with, the, for me, it's easiest to see uh in like in forms of like medications now or something like that where like uh sometimes like they're useful and they're helpful and they're you say god given because god provides through the earth but then uh when it 
binds you down and then you're like yeah, stuck yeah. and you can't yeah. get out or something and it's like then it's the house of bondage it's kind of like the evil stepmom in cinderella or something like yeah like you're like yeah you become a slave to egypt or something like that right and then uh and so there's like i don't know there's these different mothers in there then you have the the whore of babylon which is like this consuming mother or something and it's trying to get you begin with eve with his mother earth you're talking about this materialism that just provides for you and then then you have to exit it and go through this wilderness trauma type thing and then kind of be married uh mm -hmm. to the married back to eve or something in a sense and, uh, right. instead of yeah instead of the regression like you're talking about and going back and being a child right part, and bambi gosh this line always stood out to me because there's not much dialogue in them in the movie bambi but it's when his mom dies and then his dad just shows up and all his dad says to him is your mother can't be with you anymore and i'm just like oh, it's just it's so freaking awful it reminded me of like the initiation thing though it's just like all right yeah. poof, there she goes well, like, that happens so much in disney movies is one of the parents die or yeah. both the parents are dead and that's yeah. kind of, that's like a that trauma that cuts you off from from the world that that helps make you into an individual but yeah um yeah i think at lion king you kind of see the regression you're talking about when he goes to the akuna matata yeah. extreme and he's like screw all the responsibility i'm going back to just like yep the the oasis and yeah yeah i think that's the regression you're talking about the new age regression or something yeah, yeah. That's interesting but i don't know if there's any way to avoid it because like you see like in all the stories like moses after he kills the egyptian like goes to midian for 40 years joseph yeah. you know gets thrown in the well and then he spends all those years in egypt before his family he's reunited with his family then david he he gets chased off and he's wilderness. wandering around uh, yeah yeah joe yeah. like everyone follows that like and then then jesus uh at the beginning of his ministry he he goes 40 days and 40 nights um fast yeah. in the wilderness and is tempted by satan um yeah yeah you see that sort of like i don't think there's any any avoiding I, yeah i don't think so either i think the thing with all those two is that they come back too though it's like yeah in the yeah, lion king in the back. lion king he nala goes to get him and he like didn't want to come back he's like no i'll just like if moses would have stayed in midian and just been like no screw it i'm not gonna go back or or Jesus didn't actually go to Jerusalem. He's like, oh, I'll just go through yeah, the wilderness right. and I'll go. I'll just stay in the woods. And not yeah, even, you, you have to come know. back. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you have to come back and yeah, be, like, be married to the. And that's that. And that's that. Reckon like uh, a new, like there's been a transformation that's happened and then there needs to be a new integration or reconciliation between everything again. Oh, yeah. That's a nice thing. Because that's like, because David, you know, he's anointed king, but then he gets exiled, basically. And then when Saul dies, he comes back and then he, he has to come back as king. Um, and, you know, yeah. same with like Moses. Moses, he was trying to help his people. He kills the Egyptian and that, that doesn't go well. So he goes into <laughs> exile to Midian 40 years and then he comes uh -huh. back as a deliverer. Like, yeah, like what? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Like that, it is crazy. Yeah. And then Job, Job loses everything, goes through this period of suffering, comes back as the mediator. Yeah. Joseph is second in charge of Egypt after his. Yeah. 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 And you kind of wonder, you even wonder about the prodigal son too. He's probably going to be a, a mediator of that. Uh, mediator to his older brother yeah and it's in the father oh. and be like yeah uh, yeah yeah it seems to yeah that's it's the story of creation i guess i don't know it's the story of creation and reconciliation and it's like i think that is the uh, yeah the suffering servant it's the cross and everything that you know is a uh, in order for mm -hmm. creation to be possible you have to have that that space already prepared like you're talking about that has to be already this this thing has to be accomplished or prepared or uh made ready for creation because in the yeah. creation it has to find its own identity otherwise it's just gonna end up uh 
fracturing or something or yeah like it's gonna be it's yeah you don't want something just being 100 percent yourself it's like it has to no. be something new and then but then once it's something new then it's it's gone from the one to the two and how do you bring it back into the one again and it's that I think but, uh, it's through love and then you're still yeah. you still have the one and the two. You don't lose anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, I think, I think you have the unity on. and the and the two as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it works on every level. And so it's like that's just wow, it's yeah, it's just insane. It's insane. And then it's insane because like the more it happens, the more love grows. And it's like if God's love, then God God just keeps getting bigger and bigger through his creation. Yeah. Yep. His, his pattern of like fallen redemption it's like he just keeps growing bigger and bigger yeah it's, it's amazing yep i got a question for you though now that i've brought up a few do you have a favorite disney movie i like robin hood nice. um and it's got a great soundtrack yeah i just remember as a kid i watched that movie like a thousand times nice and then i mean i do like um well, I don't know. The other movies I watched when I was a kid a lot. I watched Lion King and let's see. I watched a lot of Little Mermaid, but I never really liked that movie. <laughs> I don't know why I watched it so many times. <laughs> That's your, funny. What's your favorite Disney movie? Yo, you like Fox I, and the Hound. I love Fox and the Hound. My favorite's always been Jungle Book, though, for some reason. I don't oh, know. Jungle I've Book, always liked yeah, that was, I've yeah. always liked that since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I love it. Yeah, I love Fox and the Hound. Fox and the Hound and uh, Pinocchio. It's just weird how like you can pull so much out of those stories, though. Like Pinocchio, there's just so much. It's like it's got the whole, almost like the whole story of the Bible kind of embedded in it. With mm-hmm. that, you know, he's made like Adam a thing of the material yeah, yeah. play, and then he's got to go through this whole process of yeah. being born again. Um, and then yeah, Fox, yeah, and Fox and the Hound is kind of that. Like I just I think that one's it's probably one of my favorites now just because I hated it when I was little because it just made me sad all the time. I like, I get so sad when I watched it, but then I'm like, it just, it's like this return to childlikeness. Like they're, they're finding forgiveness again for each other. And yeah, there's that innocent stage and then they grow up and they have to, they become separate. Yeah. And they have to find a way back together again. Yeah. And it's through this, yeah. Through love, through forgiveness. And it's self, self self-sacrificial too, is what I love. Like that. Yeah. The bear is trying to kill the dog, and so the fox risks his life to save him. And then yeah. the hunter is going to shoot the fox, and so the dog steps in front. It's right. just like laying down your life for your friend type thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that a was good a good one. video that you made of that. I remember that. Thanks, man. Thanks. It's a good. That's a good. The other movie. one I I watched a lot was Sword in the Stone. Really? Yeah. That one's like that one was kind of off my like I don't know why that that I watched it when I was little, but not that often. You got any any goodies from that one? Um, I no, have to rewatch that. Watching a lot. I remember it, there's it's, one part it's with got Merlin, and then oh, the, because there's the thing is like the the boy ends up becoming King Arthur because there's the sword and the stone, and the the king should be able to pull the sword out of the stone. Yeah. And, oh, this gets back to integrity. <laughs> we got right back to it because <laughs> right. like uh, the the rightful king, who's pure of heart, will be able to pull the sword out of the stone. But that did, that's not even the point of the movie, though. The 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 whole movie is about, um, uh, Arthur is is like a he's trying to become a knight. He's like this skinny little kid, and he's like serving this knight who's kind of like an idiot. And then Merlin finds him, and and Merlin's like this goofy, dopey wizard, <laughs> and he's like trying to teach the little squire about life. And and ends up like they just go on like these little adventures. Like he's like he's like let me teach you about whatever. And they he turns them into a squirrel, so they become squirrels for the day. And then like it's so one of the it's so sad because like this this uh, female squirrel, like they're speaking English back and forth, but they can't talk to the squirrels still, so they don't know squirrel language. So the squirrels are making squirrel noises. <laughs> so this female squirrel like falls in love with with him, and then. <laughs> And and is like chasing him around. He's like Merlin, help! And Merlin's like <laughs> ah, love. <laughs> finally, like Merlin, uh, like so the the female squirrels like got him in like a hug and is like 
cuddling up next to him and then and then merlin changes him back into uh into arthur and uh and like the squirrel's still like hugging onto him and then like opens his her eyes and like sees it and she's like Aww. frightened and she doesn't know what to do she's oh, like what sad. yeah it's so sad and Aww, this sad. is like the and he's like he's like i told you i'm a boy and she's <laughs> like she's like almost in tears like running back up the tree and 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 merlin was like loves the most powerful thing in the universe <laughs> and oh. then arthur's like more powerful than gravity he's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> <than gravity. laughs> so funny. but the whole uh, thing is merlin's trying to educate him because he's he hates that he's like this stupid squire for this dumb knight oh, and, okay. then, uh, and then he just by chance at the end or something he goes and he pulls the sword out of the stone and that's like how the movie ends oh wow yeah i'm gonna have to rewatch that one i'm surprised yeah. i remember that much of it but it's yeah. a good one I, I haven't That's seen cool. it for years and years. Yeah, I like the old ones. I I don't keep up with the new ones quite as much, so I don't really know. But um, I, yeah. like the old movies are just there's so much, so much in those stories. They're so good. Yeah, yeah. I need to I need to revisit them. I like the time length too on them because it's like they're just usually a little bit over an hour. So it's like I don't. Yeah. I usually can keep my attention or something too. And I can get through. It. And they're beautiful too. Like watching Bambi, I was just like, man, the watercolor paintings in that are just like the backgrounds gorgeous. and stuff. Those guys were yeah. artists, man. Yeah, they it's, were so good. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yep. All right, I got to um, get going here. Yeah, we've been going for a while, but thanks so much, man. This is yeah. This thanks for talking. So yeah, anytime. I guess we'll try to do this uh Friday, right? Yep. Again, yeah. if, if that Hopefully. works. Sherry will be available. Sherry Probably. and Cal. Cal, Kalia. Yeah, but thanks for right, talking because I, I was wanting to talk to you about some of this stuff. I'm glad we got a chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. We'll do it again too. I, I um, really like digging into this with I can send you a link. Do you want a link to download it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. I can, uh, if I throw it on my channel, I'll link yours as well. And so we can, if people see it on okay. mine, they can then go hopefully subscribe to yours or something. I'd yeah, like to try to, I'll try to direct them more to yours because I like, it, I feel like it's more helpful when all the comments are in one place. So I might let you post it for a few days first or something and then, okay. and then do that. And so then uh, maybe more of the comments will, that way people are more kind of connected to the, it's not a scattered, I guess. But Yeah, that sounds good.